So thanks for coming. It's fruit tree day, right? Class, right? Place, <laughs> right? Bat time, right? Bat channel, as they used to say. All right. Who's new to classes here at uh, Sunnyside? Get a few. Nice. Welcome. We got some experienced ones I see that have been here for a few. It's nice to be back to live and not doing everything on Zoom like it's been for the last three years. So thanks for coming down. Good question. How do you access um, these classes after the fact? You can always go on a uh, YouTube channel. Um, so we don't do Zoom anymore, but this will be up. We'll probably edit it, get rid of the garbage at the end and the rest. It'll be up maybe this afternoon, but for sure probably tomorrow. Okay. Um, and you can find it on Sunnyside to get a YouTube channel. So you'll see my ugly mug there probably 30 times in the last year we record all of them and just post them on there if you want to go back and check too so <clears throat> so i'm here all day we got plenty of time for questions um after the class i'll try to whip through this and do we're going to try to cover a lot of information i got great staff out there i've got some extra people today i'm hoping folks will go shopping afterwards get some fruit trees hopefully um we got all the supplies you need too so um you can stick around as long as you like i got umbrellas if it starts raining but uh, it might rain today it's supposed to be cold and sunny tomorrow but uh i'll start with this because somebody asked before class and it's a great question if you buy a tree today you know what's going to happen with the freezing temperature tonight and then the colder temperatures tomorrow night it's fine putting it right in the ground i'll start with that would be the best way just take it home dig your hole get it planted right get it ready to go you're fine if you're going to take a bare root, which means no soil, if you take it home in a bag, you would need to lay it on the ground and bury it with a mound of soil. No roots exposed, a little bit of insulation there will help. Um, don't bring it in the house, don't bring it in the garage unless you're going to put it in soil or water bucket or something. You can't let it dry out or the tree will not get going. So we want to make sure we keep it moist, okay? So everybody's clear on that. So we'll get a bare root at a nice discount, pop it in a plastic bag. Now what do I do with it? So we'll kind of we'll kind of talk a little about that. Last question, and I'm gonna keep going. If you put it in the house because it's so warm, but then you put it back outside when it's cold, and you bury it. Is that a problem? Yeah, don't bring it into the house. Period. You don't want it to go into shock and start leafing out early. So it needs to stay outside. Would be preferable. I don't mind the garage for a few nights again with the cold nights here for like three days. Then we can pop it into. It'd be fine. If you want to. We're happy to put your name on stuff. You pay for it, you take advantage of the discount today. We stick it in our sold area. Come back Thursday when it's not frozen. You can do it, do it that way as well, okay? So that's fine. <clears throat> so we're gonna go through uh, kind of fast and furious. Um, I'm hoping everybody here, obviously either, who's got fruit trees, they're kind of looking to, there you go. Oh, nice, everybody. And who's got no fruit trees, don't feel alone. There you go, you wanna add a couple, so. We'll hopefully give you a little information on both, um, kind of some general growing requirements. We we'll go through a lot of trees. I probably brought way too many in here. Um, if you go to our YouTube channel, which we talked about two weeks ago, I did our winter pruning class. So that was called Pruning for Production. And we covered a lot of pruning, apples, pears, cherries, all of this. Um, I'm not going to talk about that in class today, but briefly. So if you ask me after, I'll answer your questions or you can go back and check that video out. We kind of go more in detail with TVs up kind of branch structure and how to, how to prune things the right way here. We're getting towards that late January time. You know, this is fruit time here, early mid-February pruning time here as we get into mid-late winter um, before they bloom. Uh, so it's a great time to attack all those things too if you haven't, haven't gotten to it yet. So everybody's got the outline. Everybody's got their little study material. You'll have to read the whole thing. It does more than keep me on track, right? If I don't, then I don't start talking about maples or something else. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the first thing I always talk about is Eastern Washington, Western Washington. You know, I had a place, um, our family in Clay Ellen for 30 years. I've lived over here my whole life, so it was just kind of a spot to go and get away from civilization, which isn't quite the case anymore. Um, you know, there's two totally different climates in our state. And I think a lot of people struggle with the fruit tree decision. I'm not going to knock on Costco, Home Depot, Lowe's, the rest of the non-nurseries, I hate to tell you, uh, but they tend to carry stuff that does not grow very well in Western Washington. And it kills me when the customer comes in and says, got this tree at Costco for 15 bucks and it never did anything. Well, yeah, I should have sold it in Wenatchee or Yakima, <laughs> somewhere over there where it's a different climate. We are totally wet. I don't need to tell you that. We don't get very cold compared to Eastern Washington, and we don't get very warm compared to Eastern Washington. So when it comes down to fruit, it really comes down to two things, chilling hours and heating units. How warm do you get in the summer to get your fruit to ripen? And how cold or how much cold do you get in the winter to get those chilling hours to let it go dormant and produce for the next season? So you're gonna find stuff like 
grocery store fruit, you know, fancy apricots and nectarines and peaches and all this. You're not going to grow that in western Washington. We have specific <laughs> varieties of those that do better in our cooler, wetter climate. You're not going to do Granny Smith apple, Red Delicious apple. I can go on and on. Fuji's a tough grow over here. And it's not that it perhaps won't ripen, but with the wet weather, you're going to fight disease. And I don't know about you, but I'm not signing up for spraying my fruit tree once a month for the entire season to keep it clean. We want to try to get something that's naturally resistant that will grow very well over here that I'll get to the reward of eating some good fruit, right? Try to make our lives easier. So if we kind of start with that, <clears throat> so you're not going to come up after class and ask me because Granny Smith's my favorite apple, so <laughs> can't, can't do it. I've tried a couple times. Um, you know, first thing first is sun. You know, we're not going to grow fruit and shade. We need sun to get it to ripen. So. I always put six hours on my sheet. I would rather have you have more than that even if you can. Um, and I don't mean six hours like 6 a.m. to noon and then we have shade all afternoon. You know, I want the middle of the day or the afternoon preferably somewhere southwest that's got good air circulation, good sun exposure. Oh, we're gonna do classes questions after the class. I was just gonna ask if I could slide. All I see is a tree. Oh, sorry. I can move it here. No, it's okay. She's got the apricot blocking her view. It's a, it's a nice tree. There we go. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so watch the sun would be number one. You see that second thing, air circulation. You know, pruning will help with that a little bit as well. But you know, I've got a typical city yard. Mine's a double lot, luckily. But if I had a typical little small yard, it's not the end of the world, but I'm not going to try to pack eight fruit trees in a little 30 foot area. You're going to struggle down the road. We cannot keep them that small. So we need some space to let these things grow, develop, produce, and then we've got we've got uh, happy fruit eating here for the summer fall. Um, soils and drainage, and that's a tough one, you know, as we walk out and the shoes are going squish, squish, and it's wet and it's raining every day. Um, you know, I'll say this, pears and apples are always gonna be more tolerant of a heavier soil, and I don't mean you're gonna dig a hole in blue clay and get anything to live, but I'm gonna have better luck in a heavier base soil that maybe is a little bit more wet in the winter with an apple um, or a pear, Asian pear, same thing. If I'm doing cherry, plum, peach, nectarine, apricot, pretty much everything else, I want to make sure I've got decent drainage. I can't be too wet. It's going to get me in two, three years, right about the time you're psyched you can start picking fruit and eating it, the tree is going to start to decline a little bit because again, it's just too wet in that specific area, okay? Um, fertilizing and dormant spraying, you know, that's a big one kind of this time of year. Um, you know, I'm an organic gardener. EB Stone is on special 20%. We have pouches and big bags. Excellent fruit tree fertilizer. You can use it on a lot of other stuff too. Fruit berry and vine. Probably blueberries is the one thing we don't put that on. We'll, we'll cover that in the class in two weeks. But strawberry patch, raspberries, all my fruits. It's a great time to get it on now. I always try to feed kind of that. February to 1st of March time frame for my first dose of fertilizer and then go back and repeat it if you can like later May early June You know, I only do twice a year Maybe the tree needs a third dose, but that should be plenty doing it twice a year if we put the appropriate amount on there mulch it sometimes even a little bit of composted cow manure uh, Some regular compost is fine. You know if we can put that down around the base mulch that area even on an old tree we're going to help we're not going to ever feed right on the trunk <clears throat> but if we can go out just a little bit get ourselves a nice little sprinkle down there either wash it into the soil mother nature is going to do it for you right now i'll typically put that down and mulch right over the top of that food that locks it on the soil organic is not super water soluble so it's not going to wash through the structure like a synthetic fertilizer would so probably a little longer lasting a little better for the tree okay so a great time to feed. Um, the dormant spray is a big thing. You know, I, you know, do I, am I, I going to stand here and tell you every single one of you's got to go home and spray your tree? No, I'm not saying that at all. But if you come up and ask me about any scab, apple maggot, peach leaf curl, anything that fruit gets up here, the first question I would have: Did you have it last year? And probably, yeah, I had a little bit last year. Okay. Well, what we want to do is make sure we at least start this season clean. So we want all those old leaves out of there. We do not want diseased leaves used as mulch at the base. No mummified fruit hanging in our trees. A lot of times little critters will hang out in there and then get you right back again the next year. So if we clean that up, if we haven't done it, do that right away. And then we get dormant spray. 
<coughs> is going to kind of help protect our tree here as we get into into the spring. We never ever spray and bloom. I should make everybody say that. Never ever spray and bloom. That's the one time we can't spray. A, they kill the flowers. You'll get the bees. Whether you use organic or any other product, you're, you're not going to be happy if you spray it and bloom. You got nothing for that season. So, if you don't, it's not the end of the world. Let the tree bloom. Let the petals hit the ground. The bees have done their business. Now we can spray after that safely. So just never when you see color on the blossoms or, or when it's flowering, you want to wait till after that's gone, okay? So dormant spray, you know, I can show you what I like. Um, it's the only thing we sell now. Um, you may have something that works for you, great. I'm not gonna sit and talk you out of it if it's working for you. But I you usually swear by a combination. I like these two because I can mix these together in my sprayer. So I don't have to spray, mix, clean, do it again. Who wants to do it twice? I mean, mm -hmm. rather just do it once. So I could take a product like organic horticultural oil, use that as my insect base. When I spray oil on a tree, I'm coating everything, crotches, buds, that oil runs down and gets me a total shield, which cuts off oxygen, which means what? Bug eggs, insects, anything hanging on that wood, I'm gonna smother out here to start the season clean. So oil is half of it, and then a good form of copper is usually the better way to go. This can't be listed organic, but it's a natural spray. Copper is a pretty safe fungicide as long as we don't live on the water. We do not want to use a copper spray. We would choose a sulfur or something a little different. But this is, the, to me, the best form of copper. This is a different complex. And when I apply this on my tree, this dries, you get about 30 days of a shield up there. So that's an excellent spray in our wet weather because you could spray you can clean it, you can do all you can, your neighbor does it. The guy down the road doesn't. What happens? Wind, rain, blows those spores right back on your tree again. So this isn't maybe a, let me spray it once and you smile and I'm good for the next 12 months. We get it done now, maybe a month. We go back to the copper fungicide again if we need to, another month. So maybe it's two, three times as we get towards spring and then once we dry out, we're usually going to be a little bit safer. Is that kind of making sense? If I'm a disease, you know, I need about four hours of wet foliage. So I'm a little spore and I blow around the wind. I land on your peach as it leaves out. The way you're going to get peach leaf curl is if it's wet, which it probably is going to be here for the next couple months, then I propagate myself. Now I've got the infection. So if I can get that shield on there and repeat it a little bit, I think they're going to have much better luck with a lot of those problems. What's your percentage of those two? So you'll you read always read the labels. <laughs> but you got, you got two. I think both those are two tablespoons to a gallon. So okay. it's really easy to mix. So, you got a little tank so sprayer, a little hose end sprayer. If you're going to do the mixture, you're using and it's two tablespoons per gallon. It's one of each, one tablespoon of each. Exactly. Right yeah, okay. you can do that. Yeah, sure. yeah. Mm -hmm. So the the sprayers are really easy. Um, you know, again, my only caution is the copper. You know, if I lived on river, stream, right on the sound. The copper doesn't treat some marine invertebrates well. If you're in the city in a typical yard, it's not going to hurt anything. You know, we don't want to spray it. We don't want to drink it for sure. But, but uh, put the pets and the, the kids back in the house for you spray. But uh, one you definitely want to want to consider. Um, I think it's the copper. It's a good way to go. The other good thing with both of those, if you read the label, is it's going to tell you right on there. I can use that all through the year, so I don't have to buy six different sprays and have something for different seasons that copper is good as long as we're not 90 degrees how many days was the 90 degrees last year <laughs> and i hope you're not out spraying in august anyway you should be done with it by june so those would be a suitable um you know products to apply during the growing season as well as long as again we're careful with when things are in bloom and the temperature outside as well okay so those are on special we'll do all the specials at the end make it easy um, you know, a few more things when we look at some trees. So grafting and rootstocks. Does everybody kind of know when I say those two words, be honest? Graft, rootstock. Um, it's not has an often. My, my crew is going to get mad because I'm going to pull a tree out of the pot. Make them replant it after class. And by the way, you can see with ours, you know, A, to help protect them, and B, um, I don't have staff that I can stop life in April and send everybody across the street and say you don't have any help today because I got to go plant fruit trees. So we plant them all. That's how you take it home bare root. My staff just gently pulls it out, wraps it in a bag, off you go. So you will see them all in pots, but they can still be bare root. Now this is an apricot. This should look as yes, hard glow. 
So if I look at that tree, you know, I've got a nice little starter tree. That's got some great structure to it. I can always see that graft right at the base. Then I've got my rootstock. A lot of these trees are grafted on dwarf rootstock, mini dwarf rootstock, semi dwarf rootstock. You know, you can kind of pick your size or help pick your size by choosing the right rootstock. The vast majority of ours <coughs> are going to be classified as dwarf. Now, dwarf doesn't mean I'm going to keep my apricot tree four feet tall. I want to make sure that's clear. But instead of having a 25, 30 foot tree like an old standard, you know, I can easily keep this if I'm a good pruner, maybe 12 or 15 feet, which is very manageable, I think, for most people to pick um, and, 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 and use in the yard. So we can keep them smaller, but you're not going to butcher this thing into a little shrub. You're not going to get much action on it. The biggest thing, the reason I pulled that out is one, we never, ever, ever, ever bury that graft. I have a few people every year that we help out and replace them for them, but they think, well, I'll take it home plant that as my soil level because I don't want it to get as big and then six months later like I just didn't leaf out well yeah I gotta have this trunk out of the ground I can have soil anywhere below that graph line everyone can kind of see that knob on there I can have soil anywhere there bury the root system and I'm fine I cannot get up over that graph with any of this stuff or we're gonna have some 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 quick problems okay I'll leave him here for a minute and bring you back over so now I have to plant that again or it'll dry out right <clears throat> so grafting rootstocks is a big one um, you know one thing you'll see right on there <clears throat> I put in with combinations and espaliers is everyone kind of familiar with that no. a little bit <clears throat> so let's cover those real quick because I think that you know I go back doing this for about 30 years now they were around a little bit when I started but now probably the most prevalent fruit is what they would call combination fruit trees or espaliers so if we look at a typical fruit I've got a typical size city yard. I don't have room to plant 10, 20, 30 trees, right? I got a room. I'd like an apple, a pear, a plum, whatever it is, but I don't have room to plant two different apples to cross pollinate or two of this to cross pollinate. I got room for one. So that's where the combos will come in play. I brought a pear up, and you can see on that one, looks like. Look a little ticker tape parade. The only trees out there that I look at the in the stock, you'll see, wow, that's got a whole bunch of colors hanging on it. Each one of those branches has been grafted to a specific variety of pear in this case. So now instead of having to buy two trees, plant them in the yard, let the bees do their thing and cross pollinate, I've got one tree, the bee can just buzz around the different sections and I have five kinds of pear on a single specimen. Is that pretty cool? So this is a time saver to me and a space saver first and foremost. If we don't have room, consider a <coughs> combination. We have combination apples, we have combination cherries, we have combination European pears, as well as Asian pears. I don't do combo plum. So don't ask me for that after class. I think those are a mess. The ones I've seen grow half this way, half that way, and the Japanese takes over, the European crashes out, and I just think they're tougher to grow as a combo fruit, but we have a lot of self-fertile plums we'll talk about as well. So everyone good on combination. No, no different growing, no different fruit, nothing changes. It's just the fact that I've got five varieties, four or five always on there. So I always have my cross-pollinization covered. I don't have to worry about that second tree, okay? Now if we look up, let me see if I can get him down without killing myself. <clears throat> Put him on the table. He's real thick. Everyone see that? So that's an espaliers. Who, anyone playing around with espaliers? Nice. I think it's a great way to grow fruit. We've got a couple big ones I can show you after class we have in our gardens here. A couple of pears we've had for a lot of years. You know, this is again a huge space saver. If I don't have room for a tree, but I got a nice sunny fence where I can create a post structure to train this out, you know, I can have a fruit tree that's as tall as me and grows this way, not that way. Easier to pick. Good sun location. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to try spalia. They're kind of fun. You're torturing your tree a little bit, you know, bonsai style, but it's a heavy, heavy producing. We get a zillion pairs on a short little eight foot wide, four foot tall. We got two of them out there. We get a bazillion pairs on them because again, I'm training this out to grow laterally, develop my side spurs, and then I'm gonna have fruit to pick every single season on a much smaller area. So maybe I can keep this you know, 10 or 12 feet wide, 
on a sunny fence, not tall, and train it out that way versus, again, having to do larger trees, okay? So again, apples, we've got a couple different kinds of apples back there, have three different varieties. You can see the colors again. So I've got my pollinization taken care of. We have pears like that, and we have Asian pears. No plum, and I don't do cherry. I know some people do combo or espalier cherry. You could probably train a tree to do it, but again, I think they grow differently. They're hard to keep kind of OCD structure when you do some of the cherries and plums. The spur fruit's much easier to, to do an espalier with. So not saying you can't, I've seen them around, but espalier cherries is something, again, we just don't do here. So you've got apples and, a, and a, two different kinds of apples and then a, a couple of different pears back there as well. So everybody good with that? Espalier, you can learn some French today, right? <laughs> A thing on your combo, um, probably should mention about pruning, because sometimes maybe somebody will prune a branch off and not realize they're yep. limited. Well, well, we'll talk pruning here in a sec. <clears throat> so everybody got that. Now the next thing is, as we go through these specific varieties, you know, kind of keep in mind, what is self-fertile, which means I just need one tree, the bee visits different flowers on my tree, and I get fruit and what needs cross-pollinization. So that's two different varieties that are compatible. The bee can hop back and forth. Is that kind of clear? So it's only those two. There's a lot of good self-fertile options with some things. Other trees, there is no substitute. We have to get two varieties or take advantage of a combination type situation to get our, to get our production. Um, the biggest thing I'll say now, because someone will probably ask, is pollinators. You know, if you come in, to me and you're like my tree bloomed like crazy I got no fruit nothing even started it's probably lack of pollinator it's not because it's cold it's not because of rain that day maybe it's a disease but typically we don't have the mason bees out you need orchard mason bees we'll have ours here pretty quick in early February uh, we, <clears throat> they're easy to set up a little high for them if you've got a little home orchard uh, they're the ones that are out early. You're not going to have honeybees, bumblebees, a lot of those other bees. When it warms up, that are all over. This is the one specific, usually it's the blue orchard mason bee, that will be out doing your pollinating for you. They wake up much earlier. If you have a suitable hive, they will be back to lay their larva and give you a fresh generation every year. They're, you know, We can talk about that after class if you like. There's a few different ways to kind of help them stick around. But that would be my first suggestion. If you've got the right varieties to pollinate or you have a self-fertile tree and you're not getting production patience is part of it you're not going to take this home and expect to have a bushel of fruit the first year but two three four years go by and I still have nothing it might be you need to get a little mason beehive in there and make sure we've got some early blooming plants that might attract some of those pollinators to come into the yard yes quick question I have a comment on that sometimes if the bees aren't present you pollinators yep you can actually go out with Yep. And they actually blow the pollen across the flowers, and you become the bee. Uh, I've, I've, been, I've been OCD enough to grab one of my son's little mini paintbrushes and walk around and touch <laughs> blossoms. You can do that too if you want to spend some time. But you can, you can mechanically do it yourself. Some trees are honestly wind pollinated. We're going to talk about filberts and some other things today that you don't even have to do anything to. The wind does, takes care of it for you. But the vast majority we would want to either make sure we got a pollinator or run out there real quick and start doing doing some mixing i like the blower idea that might save some time <clears throat> um, all right so we got that disease resistance is a big thing for us you know again i personally am not worried about insects quite as much although i'm going to throw apple maggot underneath the table here because that's one i do worry about um, but i'm not as worried about bugs to be honest with you i think they're easy to notice combat take care of with something natural organic and be done with it disease is a much tougher one with our weather pattern and the wet springs that's what I would focus on if you want my recommendation if you want good healthy fruit we don't want scabbing or apple we don't want peach leaf curl we don't want mildew we don't want these things once we get them on for the season it's going to be tough to get rid of them we can control them maybe keep them from getting on our fruit but it's going to be tough to eradicate. So doing these things early might help us here as we get into summer when it does get warm and dry and, and there's not much rain left. So I would worry about disease. You know, we specifically get some varieties in that are noted for disease resistance. We're lucky to have a number of different fruit tree societies around here. If you're really into fruit, that's a great way to kind of join and learn with some of your peers. So Homish County Fruit Tree Society is our local chapter. 
We have a great research station up in Mount Vernon through to Washington State that does a lot of testing that I watch. We contribute money to that because I want to see what they can play with. I've been waiting for some new peaches. We finally got a couple that have been tested through them. Um, you know, that's kind of what they're doing is doing a six, seven, eight year trial to see if I can plant that grow up successfully. So you're not going to be disappointed, you know, like, yeah, it grew, but it's never got much on it. It's not the right tree for this side of the mountains again. So take advantage of the disease resistance and a lot of the modern genetics, because that's what they're breeding for is better, better trees, same good quality fruit, but a little easier to grow. And again, for our climate specifically, the wet spring is going to worry about the disease side a little more. Okay. <coughs> so the one thing, the last thing there, you'll see it yearly fertilizing water and maintenance. You know, we kind of talked a little bit about how to, how to feed, right? At least those two times a year. Maybe I want it to get a little bigger quicker. Maybe I add a third dose mid late summer, never feed in the fall. Don't waste your time in the winter, but if we do it kind of coming out of winter, that late spring, maybe one more time mid-summer, um, I think two is plenty. If the tree struggled, or maybe it's a new one, maybe you do that third, third, third fertilization, that might help you a little bit as well. Uh, one big thing up here is watering. You know, we've rain, rain, rain. That's all we've talked about, rain so far. We get to the summer, what happens? You know, we've got a really dry Mediterranean climate. You know, I need water to keep my fruit going so this is not something that's drought tolerant certainly we've got old fruit trees i don't have to run a sprinkler system every day probably even every week but if i put a new tree in this year another summer maybe a third summer i'm going to probably check it twice a week and try to water it real heavy to let it develop a nice root system so that it's a little more resilient down the road sometimes with me and old trees you know i'd be out working in the yard have an old tree sweet i'm gonna be out here weeding for a while put my hose on a little trickle or a soaker hose and just water the daylights out of it, you know, walk away for a month. You know, that's probably plenty of water to keep it happy. You don't need to do it like a sprinkler system on your lawn, you know, less often, but maybe a little longer time would be the way to go. Um, watch the new ones, especially because you can see I pulled him out. You know, if I had a magic camera, I think me included would be shocked how much root growth happens on this tree in the next six months when you put it in the ground. That doesn't mean I have a monster established root system though. I need to watch the water a little bit and I'm gonna have a, a happy specimen, okay? So we got any questions so far and then we're gonna start talking specific fruit, yeah. Uh, just to comment about the watering. Yep. We have three year old trees and I just started taking them over last summer, started watering and it was amazing how dry it was. Yep. My husband dug a trench for a water line two feet down yeah. So a little bit of water, I thought I was giving them great. Yeah. It wasn't even touching. Well, and I think that's a great that's a great example to kind of share, you know, share experiences in here because like I said, I think if you did it, you know, on a new tree, maybe it's once or twice a week at the most, it's not every day. But when we do it, it's not the quick blessing, you know, on the soil, we wet the mulch down, we walk away kind of thing. It's really soak it down. Make sure we get that water. We got a deeper root system more established down the road and then we don't need as much water as the tree matures so so make sure when you water it that's a great point i mean even in pots do the same thing i'm i'm going to stick a finger in or something down a little ways to make sure i'm okay i'm dry down there i got to water a lot of times you look at mulch it looks like dust but we still got moisture underneath there on the opposite end so just kind of check down there in the soil a little bit make sure you make sure you're getting them enough now if we start um, we're going to kind of throw apples, pears, and Asian pears together because if I say spur fruit, does everyone kind of know what's, what a spur is? Okay, we're going to pass it. We're going to play show and tell, pass it around the branch. <clears throat> so I borrowed a piece of pear this morning. Hey, this is driving me crazy, so I'm going to just get rid of that piece that needed to go anyway. But if I look at that pear branch, this is exactly like apple. You know, a little bit of this class, we're not going to talk botany too long, but I kind of have to know how my fruit tree grows to get figure out how I'm going to get production, right? So if I look at what grew last year, right, then I can look at what grew the year before and the year before that, and I can follow any plant structure down through the stems. You'll see the difference is what? One-year-old wood on a spur fruit does not have spurs yet. These are my spurs. And you see all these little side branches here? That's where I'm going to get a cluster of blossom and a bunch of fruit to pick you know if we take care of it and everything goes well that's where i'm going to get my production it's not going to be out in this one-year-old wood does that make sense to everybody 
So if I walk out every year and I lop off all my one-year-old wood, what's going to happen? Don't have one-year-old wood left means I'm not going to develop much furs, which means I'm going to be disappointed. So it's a almost a three-year process. Last year's growth, this year it'll spur. The year after that, I pick it. That's I mean, it's as easy as that. I, I'm going to pass this around. We'll put a we'll put a small piece so nobody hits anybody. <laughs> but it's I think it's a huge look online. You can find it. But look at that spur. I mean, that's a beautiful branch right there. Spur, 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 all the way along on that one-year-old wood and older than that. But get used to seeing that because that's going to be what's on your apples and your pears. And that's the only place I'm ever going to get any kind of production on it. So that'll help with your pruning, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. But that's, in, in essence, what we got to watch for on these spur-type fruits um, is look for the spurs and make sure we don't cut off all that one-year-old wood every year. We can reduce it down to a few short buds is what I would do, let it regrow and start to, then I get some spurs, more spurs, and we kind of play the orchard game. Um, it's a little different with some of the other stuff we'll talk about, but all the spur fruits, same idea. One-year-old wood, certainly remove some that's crowded, <clears throat> leave a little bit so that I get spurs so that the next year I keep that cycle going where I can continue to pick it, okay? Um, in apples, in, in a, all of ours are available in dwarf. I don't think we have much back there pears. If they tell me I can't have it, then sometimes I'll say, okay, I'll take semi-dwarf. We don't ever take standard, old standard trees. But we do have the vast majority of dwarf back there on all these. With apple, you can even do mini dwarf. Okay, that doesn't mean I'm going to have a miniature fruit. doesn't mean anything changes. It just means the root stock will not let that tree get bigger. Mini dwarf is what I did a lot of for apple, you know, and I can easily keep that at 10 feet. You know, if I'm a good pruner, eight or 10 feet is about it for mini dwarf type apples. Different rootstock, you'll see back there like a, a popular apple that everybody here, who likes Cosmic Crisp? Everybody buys Cosmic Crisp here. So we got lots of them, but I have dwarf and I have mini dwarf. So it's no different the fruit but you can pick which one for your yard that you might have space for. You know, you can keep the mini dwarf a little bit smaller. I've even seen mini dwarf whiskey barrel, you know, a large planter that would last for a lot of years. That may be an option too, if you don't have room in the ground, maybe even a suitable container tree sometimes on, on some of those mini dwarfs, okay? All, everything in spur fruit has to be cross-pollinated, okay? There is no self-fertile apple, there's no self-fertile pear, Asian pear, all the above. I have to have two different varieties <coughs> that cross pollinate to get fruit on both of them. Is that kind of clear to everybody? Because that's a huge part of this one today. Good question. That's a great question. So we'll just cover that for all of the upcoming trees. She asked, How close do these trees need to be? We don't have to be like two little soldiers, although that's ideal. Um, you know, same side of the yard has been my rule of always, and I would never go more than 100 feet, it would be just an example for me. I'm not gonna put one on the side of my house and make that bee try to find his way over my roof to the other side of the yard. Same side of the yard, it's fine. And, you know, again, the bee is gonna make the bee's life easier. If you have them close, closer together, the better you're gonna be off, but you'll still be fine. I think if you stay in that less than 100 feet away kind of thing, they'll, they'll still find their, find their way through there, okay? And that's all the ones, so we don't, have to, we don't have to do that one again. That's for all the different ones we talk about. Now, if, if the only thing I'll say with apple in particular, so pears, European pears, long neck, right? A little longer neck on them, great pears, or we carry a lot of good ones back there. Um, there's some great disease resistant ones. Like Moon Glow is one I'd look at. Orcus comes up from Orcus Island. That's one of my favorites. Um, we got a lot of classics, Bartlett, Red Bartlett, you know, you name it. We got a bunch of pears. They're all good, suitable, great varieties to grow here in Western Washington. But I have to pick any two different ones to cross pollinate and I'm fine. I don't have to worry about early, mid, late, any of that business. I just have to have two different pears that will, will cross pollinate and I'll have fruit on both. Asian pear is the same way. We get a number of Asian pears. Anybody like Asian pears? A little more shaped like an apple, super juicy. Uh, we get some pretty cool ones. They even got a couple new ones this year. Some heirloom ones I found straight from the Orient that are kind of fun. Um, you can get a little spicier flavor. You can get a little sweeter flavor. You can kind of pick, pick what you want to do. Both those different pears will also cross pollinate. I've had very good luck with European an Asian pear will also bloom and, and be compatible as far as cross-pollinization. Yes? So you're saying that 
early mid late refers to fruit ripening exactly not pollination. but bloom time will always overlap i don't think i never i would never worry about spur fruits not pollinating each other apples will have an exception here in a minute but pears are easy so all the asian pears european pears we can do what we like or again the combo does it for you you know i've got five on there i don't have to worry about it sweet i got five cool varieties of pears i can eat i don't have to worry about two different ones to cross pollinate okay so pears is one phase apples is the second part of this so apples we do have to be a little bit more careful the vast majority of apples that we carry don't carry which two you buy but there's some old apples that are sterile okay they don't produce pollen and that's the one kind of wrench that apple throws in once in a while the only one we have this year is gravenstein which is a good old-fashioned apple but it's not going to produce any pollen so if i want if i have two apple trees and one's gravenstein what's going to happen no pollen comes from gravenstein so i'm not going to get fruit on my other tree my uh, that one's going to pollinate the gravenstein does that make sense yeah. so you got to be careful with gravenstein now i got to get three or again buy a combo most of those combos will have <coughs> a good old gravenstein on there because it's a great apple a great baking dessert apple too um, but those would be ones that we'd have it covered again i don't have to worry about it there's others you know mutsu is one an old japanese apple we don't carry anymore there's a few that are sterile we have pollination charts back there on our fruit post you can check and see everything goes with all that i'm good to go there's very few sterile ones that you would find over here but gravenstein is probably the one that i would just give you a heads up on uh, keep an eye on, on that one in particular okay now you'll see on the apples you know again washington state's done some great breeding um i think it's pretty cool only people in the state of washington can have some of these apples now which is kind of fun uh, we have people call from on the internet or email from all over the country us can you ship me 10 cosmic crips he double hockey sticks no that's not going to happen <laughs> um because we don't we a i would never do it anyway but b you're, you just can't have them out of this area so cosmic crisp honey crisp is one you can sell other places but cosmic crisp sunrise magic is another one that's really good out of washington state uh, we have plenty of both of those back there and that's kind of our own little treat that we get to enjoy and don't have to share with anybody else all right um the one thing you'll see there after that is the crosses of pears you know and that's kind of cool to me the last maybe 10 years but that's something kind of we talked about with the pollinization i can use european with asian kind of interchangeably uh, there's some hybrids now that are both ready robin uh, we have back there we have maxi if you looked at them they would probably look more like an asian pear but if you ate them you would get the feeling more of a european pear if that makes sense so they're kind of a both of them mixed into one both have been really good uh, varieties for us for a number of years now and popular with what the home orchardist as well. So, so we, have, we have those back there with our pears, which you'll kind of see them in there. It's kind of a little bit different. Everything's got a picture on it and you'll look at it and go, yeah, that is a little bit different. So kind of fun. Okay. Um, the big thing, last one there, you know, I'll do a bug disease class and we'll cover some fruit stuff in that here too later in February. Um, but with apples and pears, you know besides aphids and common things that we can get a bunch of things to take care of we might get a little guy on our new growth you know probably the disease end of it would be scab you know for apple anyone had apple scab so we have a beautiful fruit and it's got brown flecks all over it it doesn't ruin the fruit it looks disgusting we usually have patches on our foliage too if we have apple scab i can spray for that and help with some of the things we've talked about but if i had scab in my apple i'm probably just not going to throw my hands up and walk away for the year hey i'm going to clean that all up so i can help out the next season but you can still eat the apples peel the scabs off they don't penetrate um into the skin if you chunk an apple in half and look at it and you're like oh that looks beautiful i just had little scabs on the outside you've got scab we peel it off make sauce eat them pies whatever you like doesn't it doesn't affect the fruit at all <coughs> the bug side of that will you know we're not no one's going to like to eat a little worm with they bite into their apple so if I cut that apple open and I see brown tunnels into the center, any kind of disturbance of bruise in there, you probably got cowling moth, apple maggot, one of the insect creatures. Now we don't eat those. At least I would not. I won't speak for you, but I would not eat that for, for my apple. So now we're done. You know, we got to make sure we get those ahead of time. Um, the sprays are easy. Dormant spray, 
there's a way to go now. I brought this in just to show. This is a really easy home orchard spray that's all natural. This is just pyrethrin, would take care of aphids, common insects that would get on the foliage. Not apple maggot, I want to make sure that's clear, but common bugs. And this has got natural sulfur in it as a fungicide. So scab, mildews, uh, blights, things like that we would help with as well. So that's a good one maybe in the season uh, to, as a substitute for one of those is, is another option. Um, on the bug side of it, it's to me it's the apple maggot would be number one. There's a bunch of other odds and ends of bugs that may get in. You can always bring in a sample, bring in pictures, whatever's going on. We're here to help get you some successful fruit growing. But watch the maggots. You know that's one we have to get early. If you wait till you have maggots, you're done for the year. You got to get that little fly before she lays all her little larvae in your fruit, which tunnels to the middle, eats the apple out, and then you're done. Um, so we got to stay ahead. This is not today. It's not March. I don't know what the weather's going to do, but I usually kind of tell people if it was me, I'd start like mid-April. <coughs> Once I saw my fruit, maybe nickel size, that's when I might start hanging out my trap or my sticky trap or whatever your, your, your method is to try to make sure you catch them before they get into the fruit. You're never going to be able to spray the fly. I can tell you right now, they're really small. Yes, you can see them once in a while on fruit and go, oh yeah, I got you and squish them and throw them in the compost. But you're just not going to win if you try to spray. I think you've got to try either a pheromone trap. You know, they look like plastic red apples. You got a pheromone lure in there. You smear a bunch of this biodegradable glue on the outside and that fly comes into your little home orchard and goes, ooh, that looks good. I'm going there. And she sticks to it. So yes, you'll have some bugs that you get to enjoy scraping off of your <laughs> plastic apples like once a month and then reapplying some more so you keep catching them. But that to me is the way to go. I think the easiest one, if you really love your apples, we get these from the Fruit Tree Society, but we have little apple pantyhose, I call them. Mm -hmm. So these are maggot barriers. My mother does this every year, bless her heart. But I don't have the patience to probably go out and tie a sack on every one of my apples on the tree. That is an absolute labor of love. You certainly can, because uh, that's a barrier that she cannot lay her egg through there the majority of the time. So that's another way, another option is a little pantyhose you can call them for, for your apples. I just got these in this year, because we're struggling to find the traps. And I think this is probably the way I'm going to go this year um, and down the road, is this is a really simple tr uh, sticky trap I can hang. I don't have to do the smearing and all the rest of this, probably still got to clean them up once in a while. I think these last three months. So maybe I do this once in April. Maybe I refresh the traps if they're full, like midsummer. But I can catch them very successfully with this fruit fly trap. And I can always buy more pheromone to reapply on it as well. Okay, you got a question? Do you need one for each tree? Well, that's a great question. You know, on a young tree, yes, you would just need one, if any. Um, you know, maybe not worry about it for a couple years, to be honest. I'd rather you not get a bunch of fruit right away. <clears throat> but down the road, you got an old tree, you're probably talking about three, kind of in a triangle, maybe just a little taller than me to try to catch most of them. You're not going to get all of them, you know, but you'll get most, and I don't mind sharing. You know, I, you got a few of them, I'm cool with that, but I got most of my crops that I get to enjoy kind of thing. Okay? Yes? We got a big, massive, 30-year-old tree, and it drops a lot of fruit and maggots. Okay. What should I do with that fruit? Get rid of it. You don't want that sitting on the ground. Anything hanging, I'll grab a broom, knock it out, sweep it up, get rid of it. Don't compost it in the yard. They'll just hatch out next year. She'll fly right back to the same place again. Uh, get rid of it. You know, send it to the city compost. Let them <laughs> let, let them burn it down. Yeah, they'll get they'll get it heated up enough to kill them. Uh, but yeah, you want to get all that out of there because that's kind of that. And then you doing a dormant spray would be an ideal way to start, you know, fresh for another season. You know, kind of thing. Okay. So apple maggots, and the, on the pear side of it, I would only bring up maybe two things. Um, and I'll have slides of this in my disease show because it's I can't really leave to show you. But um, anybody who got pears, we've had a lot of black, you know, black on pear, black on foliage, shriveled growth. Okay, that's the bad end of pear. I would say the pear blight. Um, I have to get that sprayed for now if I had that to try to prevent it, and that's one. I'm gonna probably try to repeat once a month in this wet season. The black will get on the fruit and ruin my fruit. That's the one with the, the pear blights a little more prevalent around here. 
The other side of that is pear rust. Who's had pear with big orangey kind of blisters on them? You know, that one, yeah, it looks disgusting. It probably looks worse on the blade, but it's not as bad, to be honest. We still want to try to get rid of it, but it tends not to get on the fruit. So my leaves look terrible, but I still got plenty of edible fruit on there if the tree's happy. The problem with rust in particular is this is one of those alternate host problems. So who's got western red cedar in their yard or neighborhood? I'll raise my two of my hands. If you got western red cedar, you're probably going to have pear rust on your pear if you got it in your yard. And I would not tell you to run home and cut every single cedar down for five square blocks. They're okay. But just makes, okay, I got cedar. I want to need to watch this a little bit more because it doesn't affect the cedar, it affects the pear. But that's usually where it blows out of every spring um, in the wet weather. Okay, yeah, quick one. I treat a lot of orchards and stuff. But I've come across two things in particular on pears in the last four years. Mm -hmm. And that's pear facilities. Yep. Which are elongated aphid that get yep. you suck into it. Yep. They can destroy a pear tree in one season. Oh, yeah. Defoliate it, turn the fruit black, the whole nine yards. Yep. And then blister mites is another one. Yep. Yeah, we've seen a little bit of samples come in. You know, we get a lot of, a lot of, yeah, it's great. A lot of you come down with a little leaf and what's going on and how do I help this, which is what we're here for. Um, and I do see a little bit more, more of those coming in here the last couple years. But the two big ones to me are the, the blight and the rust to start with. We can, we can use, again, the same sprays and take care of the psyllid and a number of other issues as well as we go through the season. A pretty easy one to take care of. If you had any doubt again that something was on your tree in 2022 get the dormant spray today that's phase one get it protected get it sterilized clean up the debris and then we hopefully start the season clean and then we just got to kind of manage through the weather here and what our neighbors may or may not do is the other part of it okay uh cherries is the second one you know and i brought a couple cherries up here let me just grab one here put it up on the table so I can break a light Whoa. let's see that a little better so this is a cherry is this glacier so this is a great variety called glacier um, you know this is another type of fruit again if we look at east versus west you know I don't think Bing does very well on this side of the mountains better in Wenatchee Yakima Ellensburg hotter side of the state this would be like Bing for Western Washington to me the glacier uh, we can grow a lot of cherries there's a lot of self-fertile cherries. If we looked at what we carry um, out there, I have combination again if you want a nice mix of fruits. But if I'm gonna pick a cherry, the only one that we really have that I have to get a pollinator for is Rainier. So if we want Rainier, which is the yellow pinky, great cherry, um, I need to get a pollinator for that. Any other cherry and I'll be, and I'll be fine. If the other ones we carry, sweet cherries and pie cherries are always self-fertile. So I don't have to worry about getting two. You know, we've got Glacier, Lapin, Stella, Taranavi, Black Gold, and we get a bunch of cool cherries back there. Um, but the vast majority are self-fertile, except the Rainier. Just make sure if you're doing Rainier, we have two different, another one to go with it, or a combination that covers covers it all. Now, all of our cherries are dwarf, period. You know, we get Gisela rootstock, uh, which is the same rootstock I would find in any commercial orchard in Eastern Washington or West. So dwarfing tree, heavy producing, much more tolerant of wet soil. It doesn't mean I'm gonna dig a hole in blue clay and expect the cherry to grow, but it's gonna be a lot better chance in our wetter weather with the geese of the rootstock that the tree thrives long-term. So all of ours will be on that. You'll see some of them have the tag on it. We only put one in each bundle, but all those cherries we get from locally, uh, right, and all our fruit really is locally from Barringer's, right, Mount Vernon, um, that's gonna be their rootstock they use as well. So if I look at cherry, you know, this is a great little starter tree again. It's got nice structure, but I thought we'd have some fun pruning this because I'm hoping if you buy some trees after class today that you'll let our staff prune them for you because we don't want to send you home with this. We want to send you home with about half of this and try to fix it so you don't have as much work down the road. So if I'm pruning this cherry, I'm taking off these lower branches, at least that, and I, I'll leave that for now. You know what? You're out of here too. <laughs> so we're getting rid of that first. And I, again, I don't want this for any of my fruit trees. I want this, you know, I want horizontal vase shape. That's not going to go up. Pears, apples are going to want to go this way pretty quick, but we got to get that tree center. So I am always trying to tell people, 
cut out the center. You know, we're not going to leave two of these. We're going to get rid of one for now. But down the road, I think you're going to have both of those come out of there as that tree gets older. Does that kind of make sense? So, I mean, that's a much better structure to start with. Now I can start developing side branching and then off we go, you know, for the next season. If I look at what grew, let me get this out of my eyeballs here. If I look at one of those branches, okay, that's what? Primary growth. This is what grew last year off my trunk, right? So if I look at that, that is, you know, we've talked about the spurs. One year grow, two year spur, third year I pick. This is a two year thing. So what grew last year sets flower buds, <coughs> I pick it the next year. Is that making sense? So I don't have to wait two. You know, would I cut all this off every year? No, because I'll get rid of some of my production. But what we want to do is look at that branch and keep that shape going out and up a little bit. I don't want it going back. You know, if this is my trunk and I prune that there, this bud's going to go right back across the middle, right? So I want to look at those under buds that'll keep that same structure. I can shorten it. I've still left plenty of wood that'll produce for me this year, that I, but I still go the direction I want it to down the road, okay? So that's gonna be cherry, plum, all the rest of the stuff we're kind of talking about grows like that. One year growth, second year, I pick the fruit on it. I get the budding right away. And you'll see older ones, we'll, we'll pull up a couple others here that already have short side branches. Those will bloom as well, you know, a little bit older trees down the road, okay? <clears throat> so cherries, good on dwarf rootstock. Like I said, most of the most of the ones we have are going to be self-fertile. Just Rainier is the one. It's a great cherry, probably my favorite of all of them back there. Just got to make sure we have a second one to go with the Rainier. Um, and then you'll see, I, I, I meant to take this off, but I put on there excellent bush cherries. That's something we've carried for a few years. I wasn't able to get any this year. Hopefully we'll have them back in 2023. But essentially what you've got is a tree that's not grafted at all, growing on its own rootstock. There's Romeo, Juliet, they got terrible names. <laughs> Carmen Jewel. Um, I have some of these back there, but I don't have bushes. You know, people were pretty psyched the last few years to take home a little shrubby cherry they could grow in the yard that only got six or eight feet tall they could still get great sweet cherries on it and not have a tree per se um, we have carmen jewel and crimson passion which is a really sweet cherry uh, back there out of this program i just don't have the bush form um, so these are grafted on gisela like our, our typical dwarf cherries so they're still not huge um, but but that's an option maybe for down the road we've so we've had a lot of these bush cherries in uh, for people they're bred in Saskatchewan, so super hardy. Um, they bloom a little later, which is nice up here. It's not so wet, um, but we still have to watch for, for some typical cherry issues on them as well. So we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, the common insects and diseases on cherries. The big one for me, um, yeah, we'll get some fruit flies on them here and there. The birds are probably your... I love birds, but probably your main enemy because you'll be sharing with birds and we're, I'm not in, ever interested in throwing a 20 foot net on top of my tree early summer. That's not much fun either. Um, and you'll probably catch a bunch of birds in it, which is a bummer. Um, but share a little bit, but watch your cherry ripening because the, the crows and the rest of them will probably let you know when they're ready to go. You know, oh, I got to go pick my fruit because they're starting to grab it all. So just watch, share with the birds a bit. The big one for me again would be on the disease end of it. Uh, blossom blight or when we talk about cherries they a lot of times call brown rot so if I have a cherry fruiting or honestly if you have an ornamental cherry it's the same issue plum is the same issue as well and my tree sweet comes into bloom all those beautiful pink or white flowers uh, blossom out here two days later they're brown they don't have any life to them you probably have blossom blight or I start to get my cherry to develop and they just drop, turn brown, rot, and drop off of there and not stay on the tree. Um, that's a really prevalent issue in Western Washington, especially with the wet springs. Um, it's totally doable still. You know, it's not like we can't grow these things, but that's one where sun, air circulation, a dormant spray, um, and maybe monitoring that a little bit during the season will really help you. If I had blossom blight, on my tree of any of these or ornamental <clears throat> i'm going to make sure in the winter i get all that dead wood out of there blossom blight if left unchecked will kill 
all those one-year-old branches which means you don't get the bloom the next season so if I prune that out of there they're gonna grow back and recover very quickly if I let that go for years probably not so gonna turn out so swell so if I get that pruned out get it sprayed it'll bounce right back I see it all the time here in February March on weeping cherries who's got a weeping cherry in their yard you know different than fruit but same idea the snow fountain gets white flowers and comes out and looks great a month later I'm looking at branches that look like I lit a match to them all the flowers turn brown the leaves torched but I still have green up here sweet prune it up get it out of there it grows right back down to the way it was before and you've got a happy tree for the next season okay same idea with the with the fruiting cherries make sure we get that pruned out uh, last one here peaches nectarines apricots and plums so let's do plums first um, and then we'll kind of talk about those last three because they're almost identical but uh, plums uh, we've got really two choices we have European plum some people will call them prunes you know plum prunes are little oval shape I think most people like me included grew up with too many plums in the yard It's typically a European style Italian yellow egg there's a bunch of really good ones up here um, those are going to be self fertile so if I want a really good delicious plum I can eat dry use for a number of things I'm going to gravitate towards European if I only have spot for, for the one tree. I will tell you they look great, they're big, they always come in really nice size, but I'm going to probably wait three or four years before I pick. So they may bloom a little bit, they'll grow like weeds, they look great, don't be upset. Most More people call me on Italian plum than anything here after two years. I bought that tree, it looks great, it's growing, not a speck of fruit. Just be patient. I did this for my mom when she retired years ago. I think she waited four years and then there was more plums than she could ever use after that so so give them some time to get established Japanese plums would be the other half of that or Asian plums Shiro beauty uh, lot, lots of lots of varieties we carry back there those I have to cross pollinate so if we buy a Japanese plum we keep them in two separate sections to try to make life easy and you'll see on the sign right there requires pollinator I've got to buy a Beauty and a Shiro or a Satsuma and a Shiro, two different Japanese plums that will cross pollinate and then I get fruit on both, okay? So that's another easy one. Typically, <clears throat> excuse me, the Japanese plums are going to be more round, probably more of what you find in the store to be honest with you. Typically Japanese plums I see at the markets more than I see a prune plum, uh, but you do see both. Um, they're delicious, really sweet and easy to grow. We just got to make sure we get, again, two different ones to kind of go together, okay? Um, it's the same, like I said, with the wood. The same idea when we have one year it grows out, second, the that year we set flower buds, we pick the next year. We don't have to wait two, so it's kind of the same as we talked about for cherries. You want to kind of recognize that new wood that came out, or I'm going to get the flowering so that I don't prune it off uh, during the winter months, let it bloom develop the fruit and then I can play the play the cutback game a little bit from there okay uh, what else we got for that all on dwarf again um, I will say you know for anybody got any questions on plums because we're gonna kind of lock peaches nectarines apricots into one here everybody okay on plums so the last one there would be the peach nectarine apricot um, and I'm always honest gardener um, you know honest in these classes to everyone if you're not if you're not going to spray and you're not going to prune, those would probably be the, the last of my list for to recommend to you, just to be brutally honest. You're not going to plant the most disease resistant variety of any of these on a typical year here. You're going to need to do some pruning. You're going to have to spray it um, or we're probably not going to have the best quality fruit. So that's just the honest truth. I'm going to start with that. We get specific varieties in again just for our area that will give you the best chance but that to me is not one you're ever going to walk away from. So peach, we get frost peach, which was originated right on Granite Falls. For my 30 years until the last two, it's the only peach I would ever even try to grow here. We get 100 of them every year. We sell out first every year of all the trees, um, and they grow well. We have a new one this year uh, called Sailor Summer that I've been looking for. It's got a terrible name, Q18. It might say on the tag, but it's really called Sailor Summer. Um, it's one that's been tested around here. It's white meat, which is really cool for peach. And I think it's equivalent to frost as far as disease resistance to peach leaf curl is the main culprit up here. 
So if you want a cool peach, that's probably the latest, greatest one to try out. Um, there's another one coming down the pipeline called Nanaimo that we will have hopefully in 2024. Same exact reason, Vancouver Island, same maritime climate, wetter springs, uh, that will hopefully be a little more resilient against, against the peach leaf curl. So if I bring up, let's just bring, well, I got the apricot out, but let's just bring the peach up here. Make the staff plant too again. So this is a beautiful frost peach. We got a really nice crop this year. You can see we've already pruned the roots to get you some to get you some new root development. We do that when we plant them. But you know that is a beautiful frost peach. They got really nice branching. I can look at that tree and see what exactly like we talked about with the cherries. All this one-year-old wood. These are all flower buds. You know this tree is going to be beautiful in flower here in probably just about three four weeks. These bloom pretty early, and I've got really nice maybe a few peaches that first season even if we get lucky but that's a great starter tree but it doesn't change the fact if i have peach again i want sun i want air so we're going to send this home with you we're going to clean out some of that inner wood we're going to get rid of one out of the center same way okay that's a little better structure can you see that kind of difference now i've got some nice shape i'm going to always check there's a couple little broken snubs here we'll get out but the big thing in your yard is if I've got a peach, every issue is going to start here and go down the wood. Okay, it's going to get into the tip and it's going to cause black. You're going to have dead wood, dead wood. So when this blooms or before it blooms, I really want to go through here and kind of do a little of this. I'm cutting the outside buds. I'm not just chopping off. If I cut it there, my branch is going to go again right down the middle of the tree. So I want to go to outside buds so I can continue that shape I want but I've eliminated anything that might have got in there this winter. Then I go back and spray with my copper and I'm starting the season clean. Okay, does that make sense? And then I can just kind of watch once a month. Do I need to spray again? Do I need to worry about it? And I can monitor it that way. But if you took one home today, this one probably takes a little longer than the others because we really try to cut all these tips off for you. Now someone will probably want to buy this one, right? <laughs> that's a nice little starter tree actually you know kind of get it started here you know this all looks pretty good you know I'm gonna have a much better chance that was broken a much better chance of me not getting as much leaf curl by eliminating those tip buds allowing it to grow everywhere I cut you know this is gonna shoot up that this year what's gonna happen that's gonna set flower buds and then I have that for next year and I continue that kind of cycle as we grow okay so you tip it every year I try, I mean, again, you know, you're not going to get the chainsaw on the stick and just, yeah, I'm going to saw that thing off. That's not what I'm saying. But, you know, you get a good quality pole pruner, you know, especially when they're young. You know, you can get them a good start. You're going to, they're going to be happier long term. You know, I can get in there and get some of those tips cut back and be okay. You'll see, you know, ours don't have black on, at least I hope they don't. <laughs> um, you'll see on an old tree, if you've got a peach, walk out there. Don't look at the trunk, look up at the top of the wood and see if you see that color in there. Um, then it's probably like, okay, I got to get that thing pruned a little bit. Um, and the spray on there and you're going to have a much better chance of keeping that clean. It's the same, same exact thing with the apricot. You know, that's our hard glow. We only carry hard glow and Puget Gold. Two really good varieties for Western Washington that are extremely disease resistant. But that doesn't mean immune. You know, I still have to watch in the wet spring, will I get leaf curl on this? The same exact issue with peach. So those two apricots are both great choices. Um, but just once again, you still want to do a little bit. In fact, that one I can see. I'll get you right now. You can see on that wood right there, a little bit of black towards the tip there from the wet already. So we're going to cut down below that. Now I'll have healthy growth shoot out. So same thing with that. Nectarine, we carry hardy red. That's the only nectarine we do over here. We're not going to have, again, the Wenatchee Yakima varieties that need much drier, warmer weather to, to ripen properly. So that would be, again, the, our best chance at having a disease-free uh, nectarine would be with Hardy Red. That's the, the one variety we carry back there, okay? So we a little better with the peach apricot nectarine. You know, it's kind of one of those, we won't make you sign your name. But it's like, okay, you're taking a peach tree home. I'm signing up. I'm going to take care of this tree a little bit more <clears throat> than some of the other fruit, all right? Um, the last couple things here I'll mention, 
<coughs> so nuts. Who's into growing nuts? I know I'm half nuts, but who's into growing nuts? I like to eat nuts. Yeah, there you go. Um, you know, there's some there's some really good quality nuts we grow around here. We're, we can't grow pecans. You're not going to grow pistachios. You're not going to grow some of that stuff. But we can do some great almonds. Uh, we've got two good varieties of almonds out there. Hall's Hardy is one I've had experience with for 20 plus years. You get great nuts on them every year in the fall. Boxes to take in and dry and, and use the almonds on them. Uh, those are all self fertile. That's kind of the same idea as our cherry, plum, not really peach, apricot, nectarine, but that same idea, same growth pattern, same things to watch out for. They bloom really early. You can see, I brought one in here somewhere. There you go. This is the new one I was psyched. We finally got it in yesterday and they speed planted it, so we have it today. This is our new almond called All in One. That's even a little hardier than Hall's almond. That's a beautiful tree. And what can I see on here? I've already got bud swelling. If I looked at the top of that, or you come up after, you'll see a little tiny pink in there. These bloom pretty early. So this is one again. I want to, you'll take, we'll thin out the center a little bit, check the structure for you, send you home with a happy tree. <clears throat> but for almonds, both really easy to grow um, in the garden. Good sun, good earth circulation. And um, these were maybe a little bit bigger, like 15 ish. Uh, if you don't prune, maybe 20 feet, you get an old almond tree, but still very easy to, to harvest them um, and enjoy the nuts on them. So almond, I didn't bring walnuts in, but we do carry a couple of really good walnuts. Um, you know, walnuts to me are the ultimate labor of love. You want to plant an walnut tree, see in about 10 years. You know, we're, <laughs> we're, we're going to grow, it's going to grow huge. It's a big, huge tree, a beautiful tree for the yard but we're not going to have walnuts to crack and then eat anytime soon. We got to let a walnut tree grow for a number of years, get it, the structure set, the development, and then we'll have all the nuts we ever want down the road. So we got two varieties of walnuts back there. The other one, I didn't bring one in, it's filberts. So anybody any growing filbert hazelnuts? Yeah, great nuts. Um, you know, the biggest thing that I was psyched about with filberts and hazelnuts, it's been probably the last 10 years now, you know, imagine I was doing this class down in Willamette Valley, down in Portland, okay? We're hanging out in Oregon. Everybody's growing hazelnuts commercially, right? You drive down there, if you're in Oregon, miles of hazelnut production. Biggest industry down there in the valley for commercial. I, they would not let you have a hazelnut in your yard because of that reason. You couldn't have hazelnut. So Oregon State spent a couple decades breeding out uh, filbert blight. If anyone's ever heard that, no, that's something that's in all of our neighbor, native filberts. You buy an ornamental filbert, the cool little contorted filbert for your yard, right? Those will get filbert blight. Now we have shrubs that are totally immune to it, and that's all we carry are varieties of filbert nut that are immune to the blight. So you go back there, I have to have two different filberts to cross pollinate. That's not a bee thing, those are wind. So as long as I have them out where the nice breeze can blow one pollen to the other tree, I'll get great nut production. You can fight the squirrels in the fall. <clears throat> we'll leave that for another topic. But you'll get good quality hazelnuts or filberts um, growing these new varieties. So they are immune to disease. So no spray, no issue, no death down the road. Um, and some people have old classic filberts and never have an issue with them. I've just heard a lot of people have struggled with that, especially the farther east we go here out of town. If I live on a green belt, probably never gonna try to grow old fashioned filbert or contorted filbert. I'm gonna get a new variety that is immune to that blight because there's no spray, no cure, nothing we can do for the blight except chop it down, get rid of it, sterilize our pruners and size and start over again. So, so look, try, try to get some of that new stuff in there. Um, figs, who's growing, who's trying to be a hero and grow figs? I'll raise my hand too. Um, you know, figs with, I don't, you know, 10 years ago, I don't know that I would have spent a second talking about figs like, yeah, good luck to you. You want to try to grow that, have at it. Um, I think with the way you'd call it global warming, we're not going to turn this into a climate discussion, but um, it's, it's a much warmer here in the summer and we do have enough weather to ripen them. Sometimes two crops a year. I've had great luck with fig, but you have to have it in all day sun. We're not going to put fig in the shade. So you got a nice sunny spot up against a wall even, you know, a barn, anywhere that you've got heat reflected will help you as well. But figs, plenty hardy to grow. We carry 
I've got some in now. I brought one in here somewhere. Where did I hide? Ooh, right in front of me. I just got these in last week. You know, don't look very pretty in the winter time. But <coughs> they're leafing. You know, big tropical foliage, just like you'd expect on a fig. This is Chicago Hardy. We get Peter's Honey, Corky's Honey Delight, Desert King. I could, we probably get 10, 12 different figs now in. Because uh, they are fun to grow. And it's a cool looking plant, even if you didn't like figs. Um, you know, worst comes to worst, we get a brutal winter. I may kill some wood, but it just grows right back up. I've seen figs die down here and start off the root system again. I mean, I don't think you're ever going to lose it anymore. Um, but to get them to ripen, we have to have the sun. So fertile, don't need to buy two, you know, play around with one. Um, we've got all the tree, a pretty good, well, again, we got more coming. There's probably three or four kinds of the trees that just came in. Um, back there, but we would also um, here pretty quick have dwarf figs, which is totally new up here. And I'll smile before I say it. They've all got terrible names, like Little Miss Figgy. <laughs> okay, good luck with that one. So, like Little Miss Figgy, there's Fig Nominal, which is I guess better than Little Miss Figgy. Um, and we have Little Rubies, another one. So I've got three for sure, and there's more coming on the pipeline. But these are a different creature. Same fig, doesn't change the size of the fruit, but I've got a small plant. You know, this is for people that want to have fun and grow something cool in a pot. You know, in a small garden and never have really a tree, but something three, four feet, maybe six feet on the tallest ones. Totally different creature than trying to grow a regular fig tree. So if you want to play around with some figs, those were kind of fun. We had a bunch last year. They'll come in a little bit later. Those are not a bare root thing or early. I would guess probably by late March, early April, we should have a pretty good dose of those in. We have a, a wish list. You're more than welcome to leave your name. We'll give you a heads up when they come. You come down and grab one then. Uh, we do have lots coming. That was a popular choice last year around here. So we don't have like five coming, but like 30 or 40 of each of those coming down the pipeline. Yes? Can you plant the figs close to the apple trees? Do any of these have to be <coughs> No, okay, that, that's a great question because she asked, do I have to plant it, you know, can I plant it close to this or that? You can plant any of these trees in any kind of sequence you want, but the first thing we talked about was sun and air circulation. So knowing what apple you're talking about would be huge, you know, is it a dwarf, a mini dwarf? If I take a typical, you know, the vast majority of stuff we've talked about today, if I had a 15 foot circle, I'm good with that, okay, 15 feet which means I skip what to my next trunk? No, 15 feet is probably enough because then I'm going seven this way, seven that way, you see what I mean? So if you do 20 is even better because again, I'm not interested in this, I want this. So I can pick it easy, grow it easy. So you can go 20 feet is even better, but 15 to me would be the magic number. I would not go six, eight feet, six, eight feet. You'll be happy for you know, maybe a decade and then you're going to start going great which one's got to go because you can't keep them out of each other there's just too much in a small area okay so give them a little bit of room uh what else we got figs oh the last one is i smile persimmons so who's 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 been growing persimmons anybody in a few not a one okay <laughs> i should well I'll, I'll tell you persimmons it's I, like, I love persimmons, I'll speak for me. I think it's an unbelievably delicious fruit. It's one of those super fruits with all the crazy things that all our bodies need and they've got all of it. Um, you know, again, 10 years ago, I would have said, yeah, go find it online, good luck to you. Because um, the problem with persimmon is the, the traditional persimmons, Fuyu, Hiro, a lot of the Japanese grow in Asian cultures, they all ripen in mid-November, which I would say your chances of uh, that ripening here in Western Washington by mid-November is as close to zero as we possibly could get. How's that for the honest truth? Um, so I try to find cooler persimmons that A, ripen earlier and might be a little easier to grow. Persimmon is a really pretty tree. It probably top five fall color trees of anything I've ever seen. It is a really cool looking tree. Sweet, I got fruits even better, but I think it's a cool tree to just grow if I want the fruit on it, be careful what you get. I try every year to get Russian persimmons, American persimmons, which are way better than Asian. I'm still waiting on ours. Um, we got two of them in yesterday that I've been waiting for. One of them's called chocolate persimmon. The other one's called coffee cake, and they look 
like chocolate coffee cake. They're pretty cool flesh on them. Um, but the difference is those ripen one month earlier. I give myself a much better chance by mid-October of having successful persimmon than mid-November, you know, just to be brutally honest. Um, they, they're both astringent. I can use them as cross-pollinators to get even more fruit and get it quicker. So if I was going to try to grow that, you would essentially buy one of each. They're not 30-foot trees, but probably 15-ish foot. There's not really dwarf or different rootstock. Uh, they put them on a loaded, they call lotus rootstock on most of the persimmons. Um, but I think they'll be good for Western Washington. We've had a few off and on over the years that we try to locate that are easier to grow. Um, those are the two this year so far for sure. Um, I've got them in, we planted them. I, I guess we could sell them bare root if you really wanted to try a couple today. We have them in our greenhouse, which doesn't mean they're heated in there. It just means it's going to be like 14 degrees tomorrow night and I don't really want them sitting out to make sure we don't have them have them die I want to watch them leaf out so um, if you do want that I'd much rather have you put your name on it you're more than welcome to pay for it we hold it here for you for a while until you can get in the ground when it's a little bit warmer how's that for a deal we'll, we'll keep it safe in the, 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 the hoop house back there yes okay I only have compost at home if I take one of the barracudes and I just stick it in a big thing of compost absolutely yeah and then you take that compost and use it in your planting hole okay so I don't need this <laughs> yeah dirt. So they'll do questions here in one second. Let me just finish with this. So hey, I appreciate everybody coming. You know, fruit to me, there's a few classes a year that are extra fun to kind of teach. Rose class, I love fruits, berries, vegetables, you know, stuff you like. Sweet, I grew that, now I get to eat it. You know, I can cut the rose and bring it inside. Um, you know, fruit is very easy to grow. I think sometimes, I hopefully I didn't intimidate anybody or get you information overload, because it's not, rocket science and we're, like I said we're really here to help if you've ever got questions you got pictures what's going on how do I prune you can ask any of us anytime you know we you know like I said with the pruning especially it was just two weeks ago um, the mid-January class it's on YouTube there and we really got specific on a lot of this on how we want to prune and, and train things the right way to get to get good uh, good production down the road now for the class um, I bare rooted a couple trees on my staff just walked out because I made a couple come in to learn something today. So I, I'm sorry you got to go plant those again because um, we'll plant those again right after class. Um, but bare root's easy. You got 30% off the price. That's a huge discount doing bare root. And it's an easy way to take them home. Then I don't have to hear, well, I got to get my truck. I got to get the SUV. I got to get this. We, we could put a bag on that and get it in probably the, the tiniest little two door car and you wouldn't have to worry about coming back. So. Um, so bare roots 30 percent off if you want to grab some figs or anything out of the house back there um, we can do do the 30 on that too is fine i'll tell the staff to do that as well if you want to grab some um, the berry fertilizer is on special 20 percent off so again a couple trees you know this is something we'll give you instructions on the back you want about a half a cup on a new tree older tree we get up towards a cup or two cups if we do it a couple times a year but great organic uh, fertilizer the four pound or you want to save some money and you got a few trees get a big bag that's a great fertilizer to have in not just for fruit but again raspberry strawberry anything edible except blueberry we do a little bit different here in a couple weeks when we fertilize those those are on special dormant sprays just like the pruning class I keep this special going all through the winter trying to get people to protect their plants so if you want to grab liquid cop port oil both on 20% off as well just tell me about the class and they they'll get you the discount okay and I threw one bonus one in because who likes warm and dry me gloves so I think these are the two best gloves we found I use both these here and at my house as well um, I got huge hands so we even have XXL if you need that but we've got small medium large extra large you can have these 20% off this is insulated so if I'm cold hands usually my wife would say yeah that's me she gets the insulated ones because they're dry totally coated PVC and she stays really warm I make my hands sweat like crazy so I don't use those I use the same thing without the insulation the blue ones so totally waterproof they'll keep you plenty warm as you're out doing some work here uh, towards the end of winter and the, the wet and the cold a little bit okay and I think that gets all the discounts done so um, so we got questions oh the last thing in the back so if you look on the back table there I've got alfalfa meal bone meal blood meal if you like organic goodies 
take any of that in, you got half price. There's nothing wrong with any of that. I will say this, all of our stuff now has gone to a resealable pouch that I love because I can use a little bit, seal it up, put it in the garage, pull it back out, use a little bit, seal it up. I cannot with boxes. So EB Stone, our organic company, has finally gotten rid of the last few boxes. <clears throat> and it's basically simple. <clears throat> There's some rose food around as well. I'll have it in here for the rose class. But if you need some organic goodies, bone meal, bulbs, blood meals, great organic nitrogen. There's some great stuff back there. Take it in there, they'll ring it at half price for you too. I already took six boxes home yesterday. So there you go. <laughs> All right, questions? Uh, could you tell me about the opal or jazz apples? Are they this side of the mountain? East, east, east side for sure. East yeah, it's not, not, it's not. I want to make sure it's not a hardiness thing, okay? It's, it's just a weather thing, and you're going to have that other side of the mountains. We want warmer, drier climate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Is it good idea to plant like strawberries around the base of your apple trees and things? Or? Um, you know, she asked if it's good to plant strawberries. Um, I'll say this because whether we talk strawberries pasture grass, any of the above. I would always try to leave at least a three foot circle with nothing around the trunk. And that's just because even more if you can. I, I was four feet in my big orchard in Kalala for a lot of years um, because I want a somewhere I could feed, I can mulch and straw, not, and it's not if it's a strawberry because I got a bunch of them around my yard. Any other plant is gonna take all of that nutrient out of the surface, especially grass. You know, and if you're weeding, feeding, all the rest of it, I can't tell you people tell me they were weed whacking and took their trunk out, all the bark. Um, it's just to me, if you can, try to keep one patch just weed free. Put a little edge in, you got a place you can really focus on the tree and not let all those other plants come in. Okay. Yes? Is apricot self fertile and the pear rust, you have to pick off those leaves or I spray, but I still get it every year. Yep. So she asked too, uh, apricots, peach, nectarine, maybe I forgot to say, all those are self-fertile. I only have to have one tree always on those stone type fruits, okay? Um, the second question, the pear the rust. Pear rust. Um, you know, again, I, I see it all over my neighborhood. I've had it on mine. It, it, I think you have to live with it a little bit on the foliage. It's not the end of the world as long as we don't kill wood or get it into the ground. You've got cedar trees, what I'm guessing, and that's why it just continues to blow on. And I'm not gonna, you to go cut down all the cedar trees. But if we pick off the leaves, is that bad as well? No, I mean, picking them off is great. The biggest thing to me would be dormant spray, and maybe I do like a once a month through the wet season, and then in the fall, absolute cleanup. I'm not leaving that stuff for mulch. I'm not leaving it on the ground. I want to get it out of there. That's probably the 